Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let us continue with our tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah bi hawli Allahi wa quwwatih. And we are on ayah number 283. Qala Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala Wa in kuntum ala safarin wa lam tajidu katiban farihanum maqbuda fa in amina ba'dukum ba'dan fal yu'addi alladhi tumina amanatahu wal yattaqillaha rabbah ولا تكتم الشهادة ومن يكتمها فإنه آثم قلبه والله بما تعملون عليم. We're still on the topic of business transactions, and here he mentions if you are on a journey. Safar means journey. Originally, this word safar has this idea of coming out into view. So a woman who does not cover her face is called a safira. Because her face comes out into view. Likewise, when you travel, you come out from your home, city, or town. So you're out into view. Whereas previously you were hidden in your city, or town, or village. And he says, You do not find a scribe. You remember in the previous ayah, he was talking about writing down the debt if you contract a debt, and also taking witnesses. These are two matters that were ordered in the previous ayah. Here, the scenario is you're on a journey, and on a journey, a scribe may not be possible or forthcoming. So in a case like this, to safeguard the vendor's rights, he will take a rahan, which is a pledge. So this could be some item of value, whereby if the purchaser is unable to pay the price, then the vendor would be able to sell this pledge, the rahan, and take the money from that. So it's there to safeguard the rights of the vendor, meaning the person to whom the debt is owed. Now this point about being on a journey certainly is mentioned, but it is not a necessary condition. Rather, you could give a pledge when you're not on a journey, and we have evidence for that. In fact, the Prophet himself bought some barley from a Yahudi person, and the Yahudi person claimed that the Prophet wants to take his wealth and will not pay back the money later, because at that point the Prophet did not have any money. So here the Yahudi is claiming that the Prophet is only pretending to pay back the money later, but really he's not going to, he's just going to take the barley. Of course, that's an outrageous claim, the Prophet said. I am the trustworthy one on the earth and in the sky. He said this in response to the claim of the Yahudi. The Prophet said, if you were to entrust me, I would surely render back the trust. And then the Prophet ordered that his chain mail be given to the Yahudi as a rahan, as a pledge for the barley which he bought from the Yahudi. Actually, just a quick side note on this particular narration. You may have noticed that the Yahudi is claiming that the Prophet is untrustworthy, whereas it is well known that the Prophet is the most trustworthy person to ever walk the earth. And so it appears that righteous people are recognized by fellow righteous people, and that this Yahudi, who was far from righteous, of course, he was a kafir, did not recognize the Prophet's righteousness and the Prophet's trustworthiness. It's because this Yahudi himself is not righteous nor trustworthy. And it's a bit like how they say it takes one to know one. So righteous people recognize fellow righteous people. Do not expect evil people to recognize and appreciate the actions of the righteous. We have a similar situation where a Yahudi was coming in to al Madina. He had some clothes and the Prophet sent a person saying to the Yahudi to give us some clothes and we will pay you back later. So it was a similar thing about a debt. And the Yahudi refused. In other words, he did not trust the Prophet. So we ask, how on earth could you not trust the Prophet? This is outrageous. And it appears that, again, it takes a righteous to recognize the fellow righteous. Do not expect evil people to recognize righteous people generally speaking. Anyhow, the ayah says, فَرِهَانٌ مَقْبُوضَ مَقْبُوضَ from قَبَضَ يَقْبِضُ to take something or to seize something. 
So it is a rahan which is taken, meaning by hand. So the item is transferred. So this idea of a pledge can be resorted to if you do not have any witnesses or any scribe. And of course, like we say, this is in order to safeguard the rights of the people. Then he goes on to say, فَإِنْ أَمِنَ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَمِنَ means to feel safe. Here it means to trust the other person. So if one of you trusts the other. In other words, if you trust each other. So the vendor, for example, trusts the purchaser that the purchaser will indeed pay him the money at the later date. So if there is this trust, then Allah says, فَلْيُؤَدِّي Let him discharge. From adda yuaddi. We have dealt with this word before. فَلْيُؤَدِّي الَّذِي اُتُمِنَ اُتُمِنَ means to be entrusted. Amanata, His amana, his trust. So let the one who is trusted discharge his trust. Now the amana, the trust, is referring to the debt which he owes in this transaction. Because a debt is indeed an amana, it has to be rendered back to its rightful owner. Now Ibn Abi Hatim records that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an says that this ayah about the people trusting each other abrogates the order in the previous ayah to write down the debt and to take witnesses. As Sha'bi, another Mufassir, also said that if people trust each other, then they do not need to write down the debt nor take any witnesses. In any case, we say that to write down the debt and take witnesses is definitely a recommendation. However, the Prophet did undertake trade transactions without any scribes nor any witnesses. And then he says, وَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ رَبَّهُ Notice how the word رَبَّهُ is added in. It did not need to be. You could just say وَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ with the lam al-amr, meaning it's an order form. But the word رَبَّهُ is added. This is interesting. And the reason is, it is giving you a justification. Meaning, why do you fear Allah? You fear Allah because He is your Rabb. You do not fear anyone who is not your Rabb. Because they do not ultimately have the power to benefit you nor harm you. But your Rabb, on the other hand, can benefit you and harm you. As He has full authority over you and is therefore worthy to be feared. So we are told here that the Madin, the debtor, the one who owes the debt, needs to fear Allah. Meaning, he must discharge his debt on the due date fully without any delay without being lazy and without trying to take any shortcuts or carry out any devious trickery he needs to fear Allah Jalla wa ala, because other people's rights are at stake and then he says wala taktumu shahada the verb is katama yaktumu kitmanan which means to conceal do not conceal your testimony so if you are called as a witness to a court case do not refuse and do not try to conceal the testimony. Whatever you saw, you say. Because again, people's rights are at stake. And he says, whoever conceals it, فَإِنَّهُ Then he is آثِمٌ Meaning sinful or sinner. قَلْبُهُ His heart. So it would translate to, he is of a sinful heart. And the reason why the word heart is used, particularly here, is because when you conceal something, it is in your heart. It is not on your tongue. That's not where you conceal things. In fact, that's when you reveal things. So the heart which conceals knowledge, which needs to be known to people, is a sinful heart. Wallahu bima ta'amaluna alim. That has preceded. Okay, so reflecting on this ayah, we take from this ayah what we took from the previous ayah. Allah Jalla wa ala shows real concern about the rights of people and in particular their wealth in these past few ayat. And it goes to show us that this deen is not just about ritual acts of worship like the Salah and the Hajj and the Psalm, but rather it is about business transactions and everyday living. It has rules and regulations and guidelines for everything. You do not find too many religions out there which have such extensive guidelines. And even those religions which do have guidelines, then their guidelines do not compare in aught 
with the guidelines of this Sharia. They are the best of guidelines. We take from this ayah the fiqhi ruling of the permissibility of a rahan. We notice that he says maqbuda, something which is taken by hand or seized. So does the rahan literally have to move places from the rahin to the murtahin? Some scholars say yes. The rahan literally needs to physically move from the possession of the rahin to the murtahin. And the weightier opinion is that it does not, and that this is not a condition. Rather, the reason why the word maqbuda is used is because the perfect type of rahan is when you hand it over. Yes, we all agree to that. But it does not mean to say that it is a condition for the rahan to be correct. The rahan becomes lazim, it becomes an obligation from the mere agreement. Because when you made your agreement, then you have completed the contract, meaning the contract is made. That is the aqt. Plural is uqud. And what does Allah Jalla wa'ala say about the aqt? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu awfu bil uqud. O you who believe, fulfill your contracts. So the contracts needs to be fulfilled whether you handed anything over or not. We also mention that there are those who say that this ayah abrogates the provisions of the last ayah. It is better not to claim abrogation here, but rather we can say that even if we take the order of the last ayah to be an obligation, then this ayah is making a takhsis, not a naskh. So it is saying that you do not need to write anything down or call witnesses if you are unable to do so, supposing you are on a journey where witnesses and scribes are not easily found. But if they are easily found, then yes, you must write it down and call witnesses. We take the obligation of fearing Allah when you are conducting your business dealings. Notice how he ends the ayah by saying that Allah is alim, knowledgeable of what you are doing. So this means he will take you to task. We also take that you are not allowed to conceal your testimony. We mentioned before that the ada is fardu'ain upon you. As for the tahammul, it is fard kifaya. Let's take ayah number 284. So we have now finished talking about business dealings and we return back to matters of pure Tawheed as this surah wraps up. The words in this particular ayah are not too difficult. We have come across most of them. He says, to Allah, meaning to Allah alone, belongs what is in the samawat, plural of sama, meaning highness. Or we could say the layers of the heavens, and there are seven layers. And this is not Jannah. Jannah is different to the samawat. Jannah is above the samawat. As for ard, this means the earth. Wa in tubudu, from abda yubdi, to make something come out into view. So it is to disclose something. Ma fi anfusikum, what is in yourself, meaning your intentions and your thoughts. Yuhasibukum, from hisab, which means an accounting, he will take you to account. Now what is referred to here is, he will make you acknowledge your intentions and your thoughts. And then thereafter, what will happen? He tells us, فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَعْ He may forgive whom he wills and punish whom he wills. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. That is clear. So overall, the ayah is fairly clear. However, there is a big talking point that comes from this ayah, which is to ask, is this ayah abrogated by the last ayah, 286? The key narration in the Sahih is that when the companions heard of this particular ayah, 284, they went to the Prophet and they said, that we have been burdened with tasks that we can bear. The Salah, Siyam, Jihad, Sadaqa. But now this ayah has come down telling us that we will be taken to account even for those thoughts inside ourselves. And we are unable to cope with this. To which the Prophet said, Do you wish to say, just like the Ahlul Kitab before you said, we heard and we disobeyed? 
but rather you should say Samirna wa ata'na ghufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al-masir and these are the words in ayah 286 so when they uttered these words the narration in the sahih says that Allah abrogated the provisions of this particular ayah of course the words remain but the ruling was abrogated in that Allah will not take you to account about those things which you conceal in yourselves when Allah talks about لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها and this opinion is the opinion of many Sahaba and Tabi'in there is a second opinion which says that this particular ayah 284 is not abrogated and this second opinion is the one that we adopt and it is the correct opinion for the following reason that there is no clash in the first place this ayah is not talking about those thoughts that come to your mind which you have no control over rather this ayah is speaking about your firm intentions so if you intend to commit an evil action so this is a firm resolution you've made then yes you will be taken to account as Allah says وَلَكِنْ يُؤَاخِذُكُمْ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ He takes you to account for what your hearts have earned meaning the evil actions that your hearts have committed so some people are in doubt as to whether Islam is true or whether Allah exists and this is a genuine doubt we're talking about not just some whispers some people are harboring nifaq they will be taken to account for all that they conceal inside themselves so this ayah is not abrogated rather we say it is muhkam which means not abrogated in this context so we need to be careful about claims of abrogation and study them and examine them from all angles as for the forgiveness and punishment then this is the divine prerogative of Allah Jalla wa'ala let's reflect on this ayah we find that Allah owns all things in the heavens and the earth and this is from his rububiyyah and of course he is unique in this regard we find that not only does Allah know everything you conceal and that which you disclose but rather will take you to account for it now taking somebody to account does not necessarily mean he will punish you as we find he says that he will forgive some and punish others depending on his wisdom so he has the ability to take us to account and to punish us and to forgive us he has all this ability again from his rububiyya we take from this ayah the vital lesson that you must never make evil intentions that is to say evil resolutions because you will be taken to account for these evil resolutions unless of course you give them up for the sake of Allah so let's say you make an intention that is a resolution to do something evil then you remember Allah Jalla wa ala and give it up for the sake of Allah then that would be reward worthy we also notice that he ends the ayah by saying that he is Qadir of everything so he's able to do all things the reason why he ends with this particular name of his is because he's talking about the muhasaba taking into account and this is on Yawm al Qiyamah which of course is an amazing event and so Allah is telling us that he is able to resurrect people and take them to account and only a person who is able to do all things would be able to conduct the day of judgment and the reckoning. Hada wallahu a'lam.